Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Center for English Language Symposium, Creating Learning Designers. Thank you, Your Excellency, and and everyone for uh, for joining us on this momentous occasion. We very much appreciate your attendance. And now we will listen to some verses from the Holy Quran recited by Abdullah Al Al Angari. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نون والقلم وما يسطرون ما أنت بنعمة ربك بمجنون وإن لك لأجرا غير ممنون وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم فستبصر ويبصرون بأيكم المفتون إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين And now, to commence this symposium, Mr. Eli Gazel, the director of the Center for the English Language, will give the opening remarks. Mr. Eli? Good morning, everybody. I was asked to cut my talk very, very short, so I'll only be a few minutes. Uh, first, it gives us a great pleasure to extend to all of you who've come here today and tomorrow a warm welcome, and on behalf of the Center for English Language and the Ministry of Education, good morning and welcome. We are extremely grateful, Your Excellency, for coming here today, Dr. Ahmed Alisa, and the Vice Minister, Dr. Abdurrahman Al Asmi, the Deputy Ministers, the guests, and everybody else. The first symposium for English language is under the title of Creating Learning Designers. Now, why did we say Creating Learning Designers? Well, first of all, information and technologies are developing on an unprecedented rate. So in the 21st century, our children will need to learn how to learn in order to keep up with the fast change. And the Center for English Language is collaborating with every stakeholder in the ministries, local and international, in order to do this. So during this symposium, we will be listening to inspiring students, exceptional educators, and international partners who will share their experiences with us today and tomorrow. The center is also working on several uh, projects at the moment. I will just name a few, but during the day and tomorrow, you will see a lot of them as well innovative assessment models, language competency challenges, research on the current situation in English language learning, and professional development sessions. Once again, allow me to thank you very much, sir, for being here today, and uh, everybody else, thank you, a warm welcome, and please understand that this was a undertaking of large proportions and Everybody who volunteered, contributed, and worked hard. We don't have time to mention all the names, but once again, please allow me to express my thanks. Have a great day. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you. And now we welcome our talented speakers winners from Jeddah. Salah, would you come to the stage, please? Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to speak to you today. English language department in Jeddah launched Talent Speakers in 2015. Talent Speakers enhances the English linguistic competence of students. It includes strict criteria of students' evaluation, including 
the quality of the idea, fluency, caliber of a presentation, and the use of body language. Talent Speakers aims to develop many skills such as build self-confidence in a positive manner, publicize the innovative ideas and methods by the new generation, refine the skills that are necessary for displaying data during presentation. It also aims to develop research skills and analytical thinking. The creativity of talented speakers is about using one's imagination to come up with original ideas, think out of the box, and think global. I'm very glad to present two of, of speakers of 2017, Saad Muhammad and his topic, Being a Blind Will Affect My Life, and Mohanad al and his topic is Rumors. Finally, I would like to thank CL for having us here today. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about us. We are the children. United Nations celebrate World Children's Day every year on 12th of November to make people aware of children's rights. These are the most common rights that the children must get. They should get proper care and love by parents and family. They should get healthy food, clean clothes and security. They should feel safe at home, school, or other places. They should get special care when disabled or sick. Should I start? Okay. Assalamu okay. alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On this special occasion, I take this opportunity to present myself. I am Saad Muhammad, a student of grade 12 from Arafat Secondary School, Jeddah KSA. Today, I'll answer a following question. That is, being a visually impaired will affect my life? Hmm, we'll see about that. But before that, my aim here is to convey a very important message to all. That is, no matter how life treats us with issues and difficulties, we should be able to face them with grace and dignity. My childhood was quite challenging for me as I am visually impaired. At first, I faced great difficulties in my learning process. Gradually, I started to explore my inner abilities and skills especially in learning English language by practicing it on a daily basis. <clears throat> Today, I stand before you all after passing different stages, especially the talented speaker competition, which have boosted my confidence for delivering speeches in front of a large audience. And this was possible only by the grace of Almighty Allah and then my supportive family and principal and wonderful teachers. I was born as a premature child. I was kept in the incubator for three months. Do you know what an incubator is? An incubator is a medial device used to maintain an optimal environment for the care of a newborn. Generally, it is used for the premature babies. My family have visited me for three months. After that, I was discharged and sent back home. But after two months, after two months, at that time, the doctor found that I have a retina detachment because I was having a regular checkup. So the doctor operated my eye, but unfortunately, it wasn't successful. Alhamdulillah. And then I grew up, and I joined an Arabic primary school. In grade one, I struggled a lot due to language problems, but my teachers were helpful. 
and I made some amazing friends, and I'm glad that we are still friends. I hope our friendship lasts forever. My childhood was amazing. I lived like a normal child. I used to watch cartoons and animated movies on TV. <laughs> One of my favorite movies I remember was Finding Nemo. And I used to play with the animal toys a lot. And I had pets in my home. My family have supported me a lot. I have a mentor in my life as well, Mr. Salim Badahman. He's a visually impaired like me as well. He helped me with my homeworks and my studies. He's not only my teacher, but my best friend as well. I met him at a rehabilitation center for the visually impaired people called Ipsar Foundation. The chairman and founder of Ipsar is Mr. Mohammed Tofik Billo. He's also visually impaired like me. He and his family have arranged hiking trips, boat trips, and have also arranged horse riding classes for me. In future, my aim is to become a zoologist. Do you know who is a zoologist? A zoologist is a scientist who studies animals. Zoologists are experts in everything about animals, from their cells to the history of their evolution. Now, some of you might be wondering how a visually impaired person can do all of these activities and dream of being a zoologist at the same time? Well, I believe that if we work hard with determination, dedication, and willpower, we can achieve all of our goals. And I can't express my joy and happiness for being a part of this great event. Indeed, it's an amazing experience. Lastly, I would like to thank my principal, Mr. Dafir Al-Gherni, and my wonderful teachers, Mr. Ziad al and Basim Al-Ghamdi. And I would like to thank the English language department of Jeddah. Thank you all who have supported me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I am Muhannad and I'm from King Fahd Middle School and I'm ninth grade student. What a great experience. Talented Speakers was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever worked for. Thanks to teacher Muhammad Falata for his support and giving me the chance to join it. And of course, thanks to teacher Muhammad Salami for his assistance in preparing the speech. I've worked for months just to achieve one goal and enter the final stage of this competition. So far, the journey has affected me so positively. It's not just about improving my speaking skills, but my English as a whole. My confidence and the most important thing, it has shown me that nothing is impossible in this life. So thanks to ELDJ for such an amazing competition. As you know, we have lots of dangerous conflicts and hefty challenges. We have to fix them to become a role model life. But why? Because our religion is Islam. Our constitutions are the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. And our curriculums are Islamic ones. And we live Islamic lifestyles. So if we apply our religion in our lives, 
our cities will be the best, our management will be the most successful, and our achievements will be the greatest amongst all. So I'm going to talk about the most important issue on our social media, rumors, and how to assess and treat the consequences. But first of all, what is a rumor? It's a version of events, a piece of gossip, circulates from person to person and pertains to an object, event, or issue in public concern. Rumors are very dangerous because they build on lies and spread so quickly amongst the community. And just remember, as they say, rumors are cut by haters, spread by fools, and accepted by idiots. The shade is real. How rumors are spreading between people? Of course, on social media networks, like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. Rumors can be in a meeting, and of course, in TV shows, especially the unknown channels. But of course, rumors spreads more on social media than meetings or TV shows. And the lead of no rumors said, 80% of the rumors are spreading in WhatsApp. So I want you to don't believe anything in WhatsApp. Because in WhatsApp, have a lot of rumors and it will affect our community. But how rumors are affecting our community? I tell you, if no one stops rumors from spreading around, basically it will become like a virus and it will keep spreading around and it will affect our community in a psychological way. Especially when it turns out that is a lie. So I want to ask you a quick question. Do you know how do we look like when you believe a rumor? I'm asking you all. Do you know how do we look like when you believe a rumor? We look like puppets, manipulated by the powerful hands of the rumors. And the rumors spread us control on us. We look like a game in their hands. We cannot do anything when you become in their hands. But they should stop because they're very dangerous. Well, do you know what's the most popular rumor here in Saudi Arabia? This one. There's no school tomorrow because of the dust and bad weather. When most of us read this page, they don't think about the weather or what's going on here. They only think about the last two words. Happy vacation. Don't we? But enough with the funny parts. Let's go to the serious one. Our Saudi soldiers. Our enemies try to spread a lot of rumors about them. So I'm here to talk about the men who did not know the meaning of losing, the meaning of laziness, and the meaning of fears. They fight for us. They protect us. They spend their time now, day and night on the borders and everywhere else, just to make sure that we are safe. So we have to help them. But how? To fight all these rumors about them and expose them. Treating rumors. I'll tell you how to treat anything, not only the rumors. We should follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he peace be upon him said, the one who spreads gossip will not enter paradise. How our rumors affect our vision 2030. Of course, if no one stops rumors from now, it will affect our vision 2030 and it will disrupt our country's progress. So Prince Mohammed bin Salman said, we would like to be the one of the lowest ratios in the world in the corruption index. And King Salman bin Abdulaziz has changed the lead of National Anti-Corruption Commission. So inshallah in the future, we'll fight any corruption with this organization. But in the end, why am I talking about rumors? Is it that important? As you know, the country is at war now and our enemies try to spread a lot of rumors among us to take us apart. But no way, they can't. Because first, we have Allah, the Almighty is with us. Then second, we have the wisdom of the wisest, King Salman bin Abdulaziz. Third, we have the leader of the youth, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, 
And last but not least, we have you. Yes, you. You are the next generation of this country. So let's unite together, divide, and stop rumors. I am Mohanad Dakhil. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Saleh and his very wonderful students. Weren't they a true inspiration? Please welcome to the stage His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Reza. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, this symposium is very important to us, and I hope and I wish all the success to everybody here and to the organizer of this symposium. It's very important uh, that we work hard to uh, improve and upgrade the skills of English language to our uh, teaching staff, to our leadership, and to our students in the schools. So uh, let's make sure that we uh, organize and provide all the uh, resources that necessary to uh, provide the, uh, the uh, appropriate uh, programs and uh, supporting materials uh, we should also uh, think about how to uh, uh, provide our teachers with the, uh, all the type of uh, resources in their, in their schools and make sure that we, uh, uh, we provide them also with the uh, training that they need. So hopefully that uh, the English Language Center will uh, be the uh, leader and the uh, center that provide all these kind of support. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this uh, program will be the first, but not the last. And uh, that the uh, program that we could provide uh, whether this year or in the summer or next year will be at the level that we would like to see in our schools. Thank you again and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your fine words. We would also like to thank our wonderful, uh, wonderful partners for this event. They are our sponsors. Atlas Brands Education, Alpha, and MM, your partnership is very important to us. His Excellency will now present you with a small token of our appreciation. We call up to the stage the three sponsors, Alpha Brands Education, Alpha, and MM. Now, we would like to invite Dr. Thomas uh, Lechner to the stage. He is the director of the 21st Century Academic Forum, and he will talk about the importance of learning and living English in the 21st century.
Uh, thank you very much. Slight change in the program. We're going to uh, give our appreciation through a small award to the presenters, the speakers, and everybody who participated in making this symposium hopefully a success in the coming two days. Um, shall we start with uh, his... Okay, uh, Dr. Nayaf, um, if you could step up here and grace us with your presence and give. We would like to give each one of our presenters and speakers and participants a little award. Are we ready? Now, everyone, please welcome Dr. Thomas Lechner. Mr. Thomas. Thomas. Now, welcome Dr. Abdullah Samri. Dr. Abdullah Samri. Dr. Nachaya Yehia. Dr. Nachaya. 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 Dr. Nachaya. Nachaya. Nachaya Yehia. He's not going to come. He'll be back. He'll be back. He'll be back. He'll be back. Brandon Mitchell. Brandon Mitchell. صالح القرني يوسف الصحفي فاطمة الغاندي الغاندي مس فاطمة الغاندي Kevin McDermott. Fabio Di Emilio. Fabio. Tomas Lawrence. Dania Salama. Dania Salama. She's in. Okay, she's down here. Maison Cindy. Maison. Maison Cindy. She's coming. نايف المطيري نايف جورج جورج كوتولس انغام العلوان العلوان انغام العلوان 
السلام سيمة اسماعيل سيمة سليم القرني سليم القرني سليم سليم القرني خديجة الغامدي سعد محمد مهند الدخيل دكتور بندر الصبحي دكتور هند العتيبي هدى الشريف شارلت ماي غازي جسمت محمد ابو راجح امر العودان أحمد دغريري رنا الحيدري مها المعاري عيد myself يا حيدا غيري
Thank you very much to all the speakers and presenters. Yes. All right. He needs the microphone. Okay. Oh. Um, just a little housekeeping right now. Um, after Dr. Lechner's uh, talk on the 21st cent living English in the 21st century, century, I don't know if I said that correctly. Okay. Um, just to remind you that after the, uh, Dr. Lechner's talk, we will go to the exhibition hall where we can have uh, coffee and then there are the workshops. There are four workshops going concurrently and uh, if you'd like to stay in the auditorium, we also have a featured speaker. Uh, after that, there will be the break for the prayer time at 12 o'clock. Then we will resume the second set of workshops. There are rooms A, B, C, and D. A and B will be for the gentlemen, and rooms uh, C and D will be annex, um, next to the exhibition hall for the ladies. Um, for those of you who would like a hard copy of a certificate, would you please go to the reception desk and speak to Mr. Mossad? Uh, he will take down your name and he will make all the arrangements for what you need. Thank you very much for your presence and let's have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Um, Kevin and not necessarily here. Okay, just introduce Dr. Lechner. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Le Dr. Thomas Lechner to the stage. He is the director of the 21st Century uh, Academic Forum. He will talk about the importance of learning and living English in the 21st century. Dr. Thomas. Yes, come here. Third time. Yeah, all you have to do is just use the mic, I guess. Fantastic, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Eh? There we go, the ladies are on top of it, the men, I don't know. Let's try it again, good morning everybody. That's the old English teacher in me, always trying to solicit the uh, loud greetings. Sadly, I have not been a teacher for many years and I, I miss it, so uh, I hope on this trip, I'll have an opportunity to, to visit some classrooms. First of all, I wanna thank uh, the Ministry of Education, the Center for uh, English language teaching? Is that, I didn't get that right. Yeah, Eli, you made a mistake of giving me the hardware first. I usually just take the hardware and go home, but uh, I will stay around. Thank you. It's really my pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, it's incredible what you've done with the center in such a short period of time. And uh, our organization looks forward to uh, working with the, with the center. And uh, I must admit, I'm not uh, accustomed to s staying at the podium, but I will do my best to be bound by the podium. Can we stick, there we go. Stick. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the organization that uh, I, I'm a member of. It's called the 21st Century Academic Forum. Um, we are based in the lovely state of Montana in the United States. If you don't know the location of Montana, it's uh, in the Rocky Mountain West, bordering with Canada. And uh, as of yesterday, we had about this much fresh snow in April. So uh, quite a difference in climate, to say the least. Our organization is, is dedicated to bringing together stakeholders who are interested in really developing a workforce for the 21st century and citizens for the 21st century. A lot of organizations talk about bringing uh, different stakeholders together, but it's something that's at, really at the center of our mission is to bring academic researchers, uh, people from higher ed institutions, people from K through 12 education, both educators and administrators, as well as employers, policymakers, and 
people with different perspectives on how to best prepare students for the 21st century. <clears throat> okay. They told me to point up there. It's interesting that we're well into the 21st century, but we uh, continue to, to be enamored with calling it the 21st century. And in fact, the skills that we call 21st century skills are not, in fact, unique to the 21st century at all. We've called them uh, everything from career skills to basic skills to life skills. Back as an early educator in the, in the 90s, I called them life skills. And uh, there's something I'm going to talk about today, and uh, hopefully I can be uh, of assistance with as you pursue your vision 2030. Who's driving this? Am I? Our organization spends a great deal of time looking into the future. And like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, our organization is also fixed on the year 2030 as a, as a year to look into the future and ask some very important questions. The question that our organization is particularly interested in are how can we best prepare students for the year 2030? And that will be the theme of my talk today. This is a visual that I often use for myself and our organization use for various uh, projects that we're involved in, is to look at students, and right now it's very tidy and neat, the students entering elementary school this year will graduate from high school and either enter higher education or tertiary education or the workforce in 2030. So for me, children about this age entering primary school provides a very good backdrop, a very good thing to, to focus on when thinking what do we want our education system to look like as we try to prepare these students. So a question that our organization and I personally am very, very uh, tied up into is the question of what will these kids need to know? What will they need to be able to do in the year 2030? And a complementary question is how will we as educators go about preparing them for this very uncertain future? Many, many uh, newspaper articles, blogs on the internet, talks like this are very much focused on looking into the future, whether it be the year 2030 or an unfixed period of time. And there's naturally a lot of anxiety among people about being replaced by robots, being replaced by AI. Eli, is this something I need to concern myself with? I can walk around? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I feel better already. It's so unnatural for me to just stand there. So a lot of people are very, very concerned about the future and they look at computers, they look at robots, they look at artificial intelligence, they're like, oh no. Are we going to be taken over by computers? And I think the question really to focus on is what are we as humans to do about this obviously trend that's not going to stop anytime soon of computers, robots, and AI playing a big role in our society. As an educator, I want us to look at really two things. To recognize the strengths of technology and then look at those unique strengths that we as humans possess. So one of the themes of my talk today is going to be <coughs> recognizing what computers and technology can do well and trying not to compete with those characteristics. And then similarly look at those characteristics that you, us as humans can do well and try to focus on those skills in our educational system. Now, as English language educators, we certainly need to be aware 
that there are all manner of technology that are essentially going to make the communication in English something that computers can do very well. This is a uh, app that's Android based currently called Say Hi. Why don't we play this please? Did I do that? Start a conversation with Say Hi Translate. Choose a language. Français. Tap to speak. How are you? Comment vas-tu? Hold to type. Very well. How about you? Did it stop? Okay. Uh, technology. All right, so I want to start the, this talk with the, with the idea that even now, I remember having versions of this talk four or five years ago when it was in the future, but it's here now, where I can go to any country, either input through the keyboard or speak, and the phone will translate for me. Now, the maker of this app claims that it's 95% accurate in the reproduction, which is more than I can say about myself. So as English teachers, we certainly have to think about if this technology exists and is only going to get better, what is the implication to us as English teachers? If the phone can essentially do what we're training our students to do, what are, what are the implications? That's something I want to talk about today. Likewise, I'm sure many of you have used this. I use it some, and I l actually live in Japan now, so sometimes I will type in my English, have it spit out the Japanese, and then try to fix up the mistakes. But these, again, as an English teacher, I'm, s I'm sure this is, for some of us English teachers, something we dread is the ability for students to, to use Google uh, Translate and the student write their paper through, through this method. But these are, these are realities that we face. So how can we best deal with these? An expression that we like to use is, how do we 21st centurize, or how do we best, with these realities we face in technology, how can we best teach around and using these technologies? One of the first things I think we can do is to actually use the phrase that we often use, the kind of uh, cheer cheerleading we do to our students, and really bring some reality to them. And one phrase that I've been hearing my whole career is that English is a tool of communication. It's just the tool. It's not the focus of it. It's not only grammar, but there's many other things that we're going to talk about today, the humanistic aspects of language that are as important or maybe perhaps more important now with the advent of the technology to translate our words. This is one that, as a young English teacher in Japan, in the end of the 80s and the first part of the 1990s, that drove me absolutely crazy. The teachers would say to their students, make mistakes, just feel free to make mistakes. And the moment they would start to speak or write, they, of course, would slap their hand like, nope, you made a mistake. So we need to be careful as teachers of saying one thing and doing another. If we really want to encourage students to make mistakes, we do need to allow them and provide a safe atmosphere where they can make mistakes. So I do believe this. A person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. We need to try new things. We need to allow students to make mistakes. Although I haven't been an English teacher for many years, the thing that I used all the time to drive myself 
was trying to imagine the situations where my students would actually use English in the real world. Now, being a, a teacher in Japan, we often had our students go to uh, a homestay program in Australia, the United States, Canada, or another English-speaking country. So I was constantly using the homestay family or the school that the student would attend as a, uh, as a kind of uh, a, a, a simulation of if you were sitting in a, a, with a homestay, <laughs> I can't speak this morning. If you were speaking with your uh, family in a homestay, what sort of things would you talk about? How would they judge you? And how could you get the most out of the English language that you already have learned? So for me, it's always been about communicating, making new friends, building human connections with people. It's the part of English that I tried to emphasize in my classes. And I use those simulations, those, those areas that my students would use English and think, how would they actually be graded? And as I speak a foreign language, my only foreign language is Japanese, I try to think to myself, how am I graded? How am I assessed by the people who I communicate with in Japanese? Do I think it looks like this? As I'm speaking to a person in English, am I grading? Oh, that's another, another mistake there. His past participle was incorrect. Or am I thinking, that's an interesting idea. So as an English teacher, I was always trying to create situations in the day-to-day -day classroom and assessments to try to put them in a setting that they would likely be using English. Lots of homestay settings, settings in schools, settings in public places to see how much English they can communicate to their... And most of the emphasis, emphasis being on the amount that they can communicate with about one-third of the qualitative issues of did they make some grammar mistakes. So as English teachers, it's, it's, it's too easy to get fixated on the grammar and now that we have machines that can actually communicate for our students, perhaps the emphasis should be more on the humanistic aspect of, uh, of the language, those human connections that we create. Something else I like to work with my students a lot was nonverbal communication. You'll see lots of, <coughs> a lot of studies that say nearly two-thirds of our communication is nonverbal. It's how we say it with our faces, our, our expressions, our body language, whether we're interested, whether... And again, as an English teacher, I spend a lot of emphasis with my students, having them become more aware of the nonverbal communications and how they were communicating things to people. Not just what, in terms of the words they were using, but through their expressions. So again, going back to this, th th this idea of what does technology do well and what do humans do well, computers, phones, do not have a nonverbal communication. Only humans can do that. That's a, that's a human characteristic. So we need to make our students aware of it, make them self-aware of it, how they can use it, what to be aware of. And this is something that I focused a lot, a lot with my Japanese students, who tend to be very shy, only respond to, never ask questions of other people, or initiate a conversation, always holding back. So, and it's taken a lot of effort to get them to move even an inch in, in terms of their nonverbal communications, becoming more confident, expressing interest in other people, but. All of my efforts were definitely worth it. Another thing that 
as of yet, technology cannot do well is critical thinking. This, again, is a human characteristic and something that should be woven into English classes as well. Again, from my perspective, too much focus is always on English as a language, the grammar aspects. Again, we are to meet with humans, interact with humans, and think critically. I'm a big fan of simulations. I've used them a lot in my assessments and putting situations, putting students in situations and simulations where they had to use critical thinking, reading materials in English, talking to others in English, and ultimately giving uh, a response in English has, has been something that, that I've thought about. And this is something that our center would like to, or our organization would like to work with the center of creating simulations for English teachers, performance-based assessments. Connected with critical thinking is, is problem solving. Again, using simulations, putting students either as individuals or in teams in a situation, in a simulation, and saying, here's the problem. Can you come up with solutions to this problem? So it allows them to do the most human of things, think critically, and to solve problems, and communicate all of this in English, without English being the focus. And I find myself, as a foreign language learner, when I'm not focusing on the language itself, but using it as a tool, unconsciously, subconsciously, that my language actually improves. It's funny, I, I was meeting with some people in Japan about 10 days ago, speaking in English, and they on the spot said, okay, show us how good your Japanese is. And they brought in a Japanese person and said, speak. And I found myself, because it was such an unnatural situation, the, the, the Japanese that first came out was very stilted and uncharacteristically odd. So I think students, our students, feel like that again as well. Speak English shows how good your English is. That's a, that's a tall order. So immersing students in problems that they can solve, using English in a variety of modes is a great way to get them to use English more naturally, take the emphasis off the language and onto something that they want to solve, something to do, and a task that's interesting to them. So again, this is something I want to work with Eli in the center is to create simulations that can be used where students use English as the tool to solve problems, think critically, work in teams. Again, all those things that computers cannot do. Word that you see a lot bounced around these days is humanism. And this was the first word that actually came to mind when I was asked to, to come speak to this group was, I want to talk about the humanistic aspects of English. Again, the, trying to remove the emphasis just on the language, the grammar, and to focus on the humanistic element. Language is a beautiful thing of, of and let's face it, English is a convenient language to know. You can travel nearly anywhere in the world, and I, I'm extremely lucky that English is my native tongue. You can go to a place and make connections with, with people almost immediately. And I don't believe that people are judged in the real world, I'm talking mostly to the students now, on how many mistakes you make. They're looking in your character, they're looking in your soul, they're learning about you as a person, and those are the elements of language that I hope we can emphasize more, particularly now that computers and technology make the actual translation from whether it be from Arabic or Japanese or French into English. That's the easy part now. Producing English is the easy part. And what remains now is really the core that's always been there, the humanistic element, the ability to express your humanity, to make connecting uh, uh, relationships that you hope will last for forever in some cases. So uh, the 
the main uh, function of my organization, the organization that I work for, the 21st Century Academic Forum, is we organize academic conferences. We hold conferences at least once a year at Harvard, at Berkeley. We have a relationship with the higher colleges of technology in the UAE. Um, we're looking at doing a conference here in 2019. And it's funny, I have a real love-hate relationship with conferences. And I suspect many of you might as well. And my love is we come to a place for two or three days, we talk passionately about we're going to improve ourselves as teachers, we're going to improve ourselves as learners, and we feel so, and maybe we've met some new people, we've had a little break from our routine, we've came to, come to a place, we've had a good time, and we feel, ah, top of the world. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to change. The hate part is, So we meet these people, we have a great time. The, the part that I hate is we often go back and almost within one week, we're back to those old routines, the old mental state. So I'm gonna plead with you, please try to take your enthusiasm from this conference home. Don't let it fade away. Keep connected with the people you've made connections with here. It's an exciting time. Um, some people look at these technologies like I've showed and I've talked about today and like with dread, I, I think it's an exciting thing. Particularly as an English language teacher, we can focus on the fun parts now. It doesn't all have to be grammar. We can foc on, focus on the humanistic, the actual communications part, the building of relationships, the simulations that we're gonna be working with with, this, with, this, uh, with the center. So please take this enthusiasm home. Don't let it die. Keep, it con keep connected with the people you meet here. Be brave. Make opportunity to do things in a new way. And I'm under the, the impression that all the way down from the ministry level, teacher, you're going to have support to try new things. There's a call for it. We're, uh, we need you to take, take your enthusiasm and make opportunities to do things in a new way. And I think one of the most dangerous phrases in the English language is, it's always been done this way. Particularly young teachers, please don't give in to this. Try to try new things a different way. Don't believe that things have to be done a certain way, because they don't. And you will make mistakes. But be confident through that. You will, you will have support to make mistakes as long as you're trying to do the right thing and the best thing for the students. So challenge this. Be brave. You know, and I know the reality of a teacher's life. You have tons and tons and tons of papers to grade, and there's going to be times you feel so overwhelmed that the easiest approach is to continue the way it's always been done. During those times, though, think, how can I 21st centurize my, my teaching, the curriculum? How can I do new things? How can I be brave? And I hope that you will, you know, as I've said before, keep the, the motivation that you've, you feel while you're here and to continue. And we need new ideas. And I know that the center is here, the ministry is here to, to be a place for new ideas. Am I saying the right thing? I hope so too. It's a time for new ideas. Unfortunately, the field of education has been left behind the times. So be, be brave and try to do new things. All right, I'm tired of talking and I can't seem to make sense. I do that, hope that you can join us at a 21st Century Academic Forum event. 
Uh, our next conference is at Harvard University, November 15th and 16th of this year. We're looking at holding a conference here in the, in the kingdom. Okay. Questions, comments? All right. I like to stand in the middle of the stage as well. Um, we have had some last-minute changes in schedule last night because uh, His Excellency had to catch a plane and had to leave early to the airport. Our next uh, event is going to be the panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Brendan Mitchell uh, is the moderator. Dr. Abdullah Al Asmari from King Saud University will be one of the panelists. I hope that as I am speaking, somebody is preparing the seats and the table here. Hello? I guess it is happening. All right. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Kadisha Mohammed Al Gamdi is a teacher. She'll be one of the panelists. Mr. Salim Al Garni is a teacher, will also be one of the panelists. Uh, Ms. Fatima Saad Al Gamdi is a supervisor and she will also be with us. And Mr. Yusuf Al Sahafi is a supervisor and he will be in the panel discussion. Um, Mr. Badri, you have something to say? No, no, no. All right, okay. So from now on, the schedule is working, all right? We had to change it in the morning, last minute things, do this, do that, but it's working out. So I'm left here on the stage by myself, and I only see one seat over there. <laughs> so maybe I should sit there while we're... Mr. Brandon, would you please step up, please? This is Mr. Brandon Mitchell. Um, he works with Tatweer. I am trying to figure out what's happening now with the seats. All right? All right? Seat number two. All right. We still have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A few more. They're coming. All right. Please be patient with us. Uh, would you like to say a few words before we start? Uh, can I give the mic to you? Oh, certainly. All right. There you Thank go. you, Mr. Eli. Yes. Uh, it's a great honor to be here this morning, ladies and gentlemen, at the inaugural uh, Center for English Language Symposium held in the great kingdom of Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. As a Mr. Eli mentioned this morning we'll, um, we'll move into a panel discussion in a minute with uh, someone from higher education and also two wonderful supervisors from uh, Ms. Fatima from Jeddah and Mr. Yusuf from Mecca and two super teachers. And we have a range of interesting and perhaps challenging questions that they are going to provide their thoughts and their ideas upon. And I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to have time, but hopefully we'll be able to take some questions from the, uh, from the audience here today. So when you hear some of the questions or if you'd like further information on them, perhaps you could write down any questions that you have and pass them to someone in the male section who will walk around and someone in the fem female section who will walk around. Uh, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear your thoughts on how you believe that what the center is doing to contribute significantly to the improvement in the learning and teaching of English throughout this great nation and what you think could be, could be added to it. I know that this center and all the people involved in the center are working extremely hard to be able to get their programs out throughout the kingdom, through both face-to-face -face and sort of, there will be some online modules coming, coming shortly. But your ideas, your thoughts are welcome. You are, you are the ones in the classrooms. You are the ones that uh, work with the, with the students. And uh, I understand that the classrooms, some, some vary in size, some vary in, in the ability. You know, not, not all the students have their absolutely amazing uh, English ability that we heard from the two students in, uh, in Jeddah this morning. 
you know, absolutely amazing. And I remember when I was in Tobuk for a MOE supervisor conference approximately, I think it was three years ago now, and uh, Mr. Salah, he had, the, had his students there presenting through the English speaking clubs that, he's, uh, that he'd been doing there. And I understand Miss Fatima as well from uh, Jeddah, her, her teachers have been doing it with the female side of things. And uh, Mr. Salah, this morning when I saw him, and I was complimenting what I saw in book those few years ago, he said to me, Brendan, you're going to see even better today. And I thought, well, how can it get better? And then I was able to see and witness these, these two students, you know, and um, to, the, to the young blind boy, you should be an inspiration to, to learners everywhere. Not just English language learners, but learners, doesn't matter what age you are, you know, you're an inspiration to me, what I saw from you and the challenges and how you've embraced those challenges, you know, in a, in a what most people would say is a very challenging envir environment for you. I admire you so much and I, I thank you for, for sharing your story this morning. Now, are we almost ready to go? Um, Dr. Abdullah Al Asmari from King Saud University. <laughs> Ms. Kadisha Mohammed Al Gamdi. <laughs> Mr. Salim Al Garni. Ms. Fatima Saad Al Gamdi. <laughs> Mr. Yusuf Al Sahafi. Okay, excellent. Thank you to our panelists this morning, Dr. Abdullah, Mr. Youssef, Ms. Fatima, Mr. Salim, and uh, Ms. Khadija. I think if possible, I'd like to start with the, with the teachers this morning. Okay, Mr. Salim, sir, what do you believe are the lear English learning expectations for students who are currently graduating high school. Yes, please, sir. Okay, first, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, what I think is uh, the students should be, uh, should be able, uh, I mean, skilled enough to be able to communicate with others, use their own thought, express themselves. So what I expect when students graduate from high school or manager school, so uh, they are going to uh, be able to communicate and express themselves, express them, uh, their thoughts. Excuse me, so it's my first time speaking in a, in a crowd and uh, you know, it's, yeah, I'm no, just going to get lost because no it's my problem. first time speaking in the crowd. You're, so. you're doing a fantastic job, sir, the expectation to communicate. Now, Ms. Khadija, do you have anything to add to that? What do you believe are the English language learning expectations for students who are currently graduating in your classes? Um, well, yeah. well um, we, we try to, uh, 
accept, expect a very high level. Um, they should be fluent uh, in, in the, the language. They should be able to write very uh, well uh, so they can graduate when they, when they go into college. But um, sometimes that's not true. <laughs> Their levels aren't really reaching. No, we will hear from Dr. Abdullah in a minute, but Ms. Fatima, from a supervisor's point of view, an collective point of view, what are your thoughts? Um, my belief is all of our students, are, their expectations uh, are to be able to um, attend college with the minimal, at least the, the minimal uh, uh, proficiency skills in English. And sometimes our students um, are self-taught. Sometimes they do rely on their teachers. But a lot of times, most of them, their expectations, they fall lower than what they expect. Um, and that's where we have a problem. And that's where we have an issue between us and the universities. They, they blame us and we blame them. So it's kind of like a cycle where you give us very low level learners and we say, well, you give us very low level level teachers. So it's kind of like a cycle that we need to break, but the expectations are always to be able to um, use the English language in their um, uh, higher education proficiently. And um, I think that's e what Excellent. We Thank you. Yes. I like that comment there, a cycle that we're trying to break, and I believe that the Centre for English Language will contribute to significantly bridging that gap between the expectations of both the K-12 to and higher education sector. Now, Mr. Yusuf, do you believe that there are perhaps different expectations from what the students expect to what the teachers expect? Regarding those who are graduating yes, from... Sir. Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, um, I think so. Uh, as a supervisor, uh, my expectations uh, are not that high, actually. Actually, because I'm living it, I'm, uh, I faced it in, in um, I'm facing it on actual, like, daily basis at our schools. Also, um, through my relatives, uh, neighbors, etc. So, our expectations as educators are totally different than the student themselves, and uh, um, not only the students, but also the parents, the families um, back homes, because uh, what I saw and realized is that uh, there is a huge gap or, or there is a noticeable gap between uh, students who come from well-educated families and students who come from and, uh, and let me say less educated families. Uh, we, we hope that uh, the level would be okay, but frankly speaking, uh, a student finishing high school level without being able to write a short paragraph is, is a sign of uh, a drawback in our education system. Likewise, the student themselves uh, when you talk to them, they are frustrated. So they themselves, they do not have um, great expectations, or, or, or let me say, they are not. They don't have the self-esteem needed to be uh, confident enough to take part in 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 the community itself. And also, uh, this is reflected in the life of the school, uh, that's, that's of the university itself. And that that comes back to something that Dr. S Dr. Thomas said. You said they don't have the self-confidence. You remember he had something up there that said, be brave. And he talked about not being afraid to make a mistake. And it's that sort of confidence as educators that you can perhaps look at instilling in your students. Now, Dr. Abdullah, sir, we've heard from the, uh, heard from the teachers and the supervisors. Now, do you think students are at the level they need to be in English when they graduate from high school in order to achieve their goals. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. <clears throat> I'm afraid to say no because uh, expectations at the university level are quite different from those uh, 
at the uh, elementary or intermediate or even secondary levels. We expect the students to uh, communicate creatively and independently in real and unrehearsed contexts. The classroom is, is not a real context because everything is manipulated. Questions asked to the students are manipulated. Sometimes answers that we get from st students are manipulated to some, to some extent. But I'd like to the students, if he or she goes to the college cafeteria, I would like him to order his, uh, his coffee using English, communicate with the guy there using English. This is an example of a real context. If he or she gets a job during summer, I expect them to translate a piece uh, from or into English. This is a real context. Uh, another expectation is that I'd like the student entering university to develop deep content knowledge. Uh, secondary schools, intermediate schools, too much focus is placed on skills. But in universities, uh, we'd like to shift that focus. If the student gets into mathematic, mathematical department, for example, he is dealing with a specialized language. So terminology is different, way of speaking is different, expectations are different. Excellent, thank you, Doctor. I like the point about being able to use the language in a real-life situation. And I know King Saud University has an excellent cafeteria. <laughs> okay, so perhaps we could look at uh, some, uh, some of the, the methods and perhaps a change in the methods and how that would, uh, that would contribute to the improvement of teaching and learning of English. As we know, the Centre for English Language is contributing greatly to this paradigm shift in English language education. So if we move over to, to you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fatima, from a supervisory per perspective, you know, why is transforming or making a positive change in English language teaching methods important for teachers, students, and the great kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Well, first of all, times are changing. Uh, it's faster. It's, um, students are more uh, fast-paced. They want to learn quickly. And they don't have the patience that we used to have uh, like 40 years ago or 30 years ago. But right now, students want to learn real fast. And if you don't give it to them, they're going to go online and start learning by themselves. And that's why we need to develop teachers. We have to work on two areas, teachers and students. If I have programs for students, I'm going to improve the learning process. If I have programs for the teachers, I'm working on a two-sided uh, two you know, coin. I'm not working just on my students, and that's our problem. We're not developing our teachers. They're static. So we need to uh, uh, have programs that improve our teaching methods, and they have to be in tune with what's new and what's trending. And just like Dr. Thomas, it's all about communication and the humanistic approach. It's about authentic learning. It's not about um, focusing on just the words and the vocabulary and the grammar points. They don't know how to communicate, but when you, teach, when you ask them about the particulars of a language, they know every single detail, and that's our problem. We don't know how to speak the language or write it or use it, but we know so much about it, and that's what we're focusing on right now. Excellent, thank you. I like that with uh, having to focus on both the teachers and the students. And as you can see, the Center for English Language, through their initiatives, does have that dual focus, where perhaps previously had been a focus on either one or the other. Now, Mr. Salim, sir, if we can uh, have a hear from you, please, sir. Now, why is transforming or making a positive change in English language teaching methods important for you as a teacher? Okay, first, I hope I can fix the first, you know, uh, uh, tr uh, slip I did because uh, confronting a uh, huge audience uh, such uh, such you, uh, something something difficult for me. You're well, doing first, a fantastic I, yeah. job. You're doing a fantastic thank job. You. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, bec uh, first of all, the the uh, the. Uh, for my previous answer, for uh, what I was expecting from the students, because I don't feel that I did a quite, you know, uh, satisfied, uh, you know, comment about this. 
I was, uh, I mean, the students should be uh, skilled and uh, be able to communicate, as you know, uh, here in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we don't use English uh, in communication such as uh, outside schools or college or wherever we go. So if you use English, you only use it inside class. So what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to accomplish is to uh, improve the students and try to uh, uh, try to give them the ability to be able to communicate with the outside or with the outside of school. So instead of just using it inside school, they can communicate in, in, in other facility in the streets and uh, if you want to order something from, from a shop or something. So it's not usually uh, used. That's what we are trying to uh, achieve here. So if we, uh, uh, what do we expect that we can make English is more useful and helpful and outside uh, of the uh, educational facilities? Yes. Fantastic, thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Youssef, as a, as a supervisor, you know, why is transforming or making a positive change in English language teaching methods important for both your teachers and your students? Okay. Um, nowadays, we are living in, in a world that keeps changing, and actually the change is, is rapid and fast. Uh, it sometimes it is faster than, than what we can like um, cope with. Uh, now in Saudi Arabia, we are on the merge of, of, of let me say, um, a paradigm shift in English. Uh, is ne English as a language is needed uh, to uh, um, keep up with the um, expectations of our uh, uh, kingdom. Uh, you know that uh, nowadays the vision, uh, vision uh, let me say 2030, uh, with that vision we have a lot of opportunities, a lot of like uh, for for Saudis to work uh, and 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 to uh, to fulfill the requirements of those expected jobs and and etc. Uh, our our students need to be like proficient in English. Uh, they need to um, be able to uh, um, stand up for the jobs that they are expected to uh, fulfill. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing is uh, for our uh, Teaching to be productive, we need to alter and change our ways of teaching and our methodology. Uh, nowadays, we know that technology is taking a huge part in our life. And with that being said, uh, as, as Mr. Forgive me, I, I, you know, Thomas, yeah, he said in the morning that probably you're, you'd be using your cell phone to communicate with others. So. Uh, if that's the case, if some if it is like in ten or five day, years, will technology will be taking a huge part in our life, and we are going to we are going to rely on cell phones and etc. So, what have we done to prepare ourselves and our students and our community to meet up with that you know that world? Um, uh, that's a huge question. Another thing. Let me say, for example, and, and um, I'm, I'm afraid here to say it, but uh, now like companies like Mercedes, Benz, now they're seeing that, that Tesla and the, those electric cars are the competitive, not anymore like BM or whatever. So what are our competitors in education going to be in the future? Is it the cell phone? Is it the electronic board? Is it the, I don't know. So we need to prepare ourselves by modifying our methodologies, our teaching techniques, our classrooms to be ready for that. Sure, how can we meet the needs of the, of the future and how can we adapt our methods with perhaps future technologies, which leads us into uh, a the next, the next question. And I'd like to start with you, Ms. Khadija. You know, as we've heard from Mr. Yusuf, have he talked about methodologies? You know, uh, from your experience, 
Okay, what is the most common English teaching method used by teachers and why? Well, 40 years ago or whatever, uh, basically the basic methodology that is used is a lecture. Basically, I come in as a teacher and I give them all the information and they're supposed to sit there and listen and it's like they're just taking in the information without any part in the classroom. They just listen and I give, they take. So it's like a give and take, receive concept. That is old school. That is definitely not what we need to do. I don't do that in my classrooms at all. Um, you have to have uh, an, an exchange. You have to have the girls participate in the classroom. They have to, they have to interact. They have to speak. They have to use the language in order for them to feel that it's actually real to them without using the language in the classroom, without separating between syllabus and real life, they're not going to be able to use the language. And this is something that we try to enforce in our classrooms, in our school. Uh, something that we do not see this in the majority of classrooms around the kingdom. It's basically lecture. I give and you receive. And we need to step away from that. That is definitely not what they need. As Ms. Fatma was talking about, this is a fast-paced time. Our times are, um, the, they do not want to spend hours and hours memorizing one word. They want to pick it up very quickly. They want to use it very fast. And they want to see the results very fast. And in order to see that result, you have to actually give it to them in a way that they can understand and uh, use. So just out of interest, in your classroom, what percentage of the time would it be teacher-centered or teacher talk time? And what percentage of the time would be student talk time or student-centered? Well, um, our classes are 45 minutes. We try to have the students, basically student-centered is 40 minutes of the entire class. That I, I basically influ I implement, students are the ones that are speaking, I just, um, direct. Um, we do um, group work, we do technology in the classroom, the majority of the girls are uh, independent learners, uh, they do a lot of research at home, they come back with a lot of information. Um, do we have weak students? Yes. Do we have girls that come up to high school without knowing how to write their names? Yes. Is that a challenge? Yes. How to push them, how to uh, uh, make them realize where they are and what their future is with English is a challenge and we try to reach that challenge. Excellent. Perhaps something for everybody here to reflect upon. As you can hear from Miss Khadija, she said approximately 40 minutes out of 45 minutes is student-centered. You might like to think and see what what does your class look like? Now, Dr. Dr. Abdullah, in the university setting here, you know, what, what's the most common method of teaching English used in the university setting and why? Uh, well, it's slightly different because expectations are different. But uh, at this level, we expect that students rely more on themselves. So we try to motivate them to become lifelong learners because you cannot teach language within the time dedicated to that. Uh, and this is also can be done in schools. I mean, you learning a language is a painfully slow process. You cannot achieve that within one year or two years or whatsoever. But nowadays, I think there is a a growing interest in the so-called good practices in the field. People started thinking outside the methodology box and they started to uh, encourage uh, people in the field to share the good practices. And this can be done by supervisors as well. If a supervisor pays a visit to a specific school and finds that a specific teacher is, going, is using a, a good approach or method or he can sit down with the teacher and he can share, invite other uh, uh, teachers to visit the school and to monitor what's, what's happening. So I, I don't like the word methodology, by the way. <laughs> what would you like me to use, pedagogy? Good, good practices good practice. in the field. Yes, okay. good practices in the field. 
at the at the university setting is there is there perhaps more a focus on academic writing as well does exactly. that influence on, the practice yes on on content knowledge we focus on content knowledge away from skills away from i expect the students to have basic skills in language speaking listening reading and writing so it's time for him or her to build very strong content knowledge excellent thank you doctor Mr. Ms. Fatima, you know, in terms of your your experience collective throughout your schools in uh, in Jeddah, what do you observe as the most uh, common teaching practice? Well, no, now there's a trend, the active learning, because they're focusing on it. The Ministry of Education, so they're focusing on a lot of active learning strategies. Uh, another method that I've seen is the communicative method, uh, also the humanistic. But what we need to do is the uh, the principled eclectic method, where I fit the method to the student, not the method, not the student to the method, and that's what we're doing. We're forcing students to um, learn a certain way without paying attention to their needs, and I have to have a needs analysis for my students. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, a university stage is totally different than a primary, intermediate, and, and high school education. We're still focusing on the skills because we have to lay the foundation for university stage. That's why we're, the skills are very important. And we have listening and speaking that go hand in hand. If they're a good listener, they're going to be good speakers. If they're good um, readers, they're going to be good writers. Two, each two skills go together. And so what we need to focus on right now is um, helping our teachers avoid uh, the grammar translation method, which is still being used especially when they're teaching grammar, they translate. It's effective at certain points, but not all the time, because they lose themselves in the grammar points, totally different L1 from L2. And we also have um, a lot of teachers that are still focusing on the audiolingual method, where it's about just speaking, but we're avoiding the, the writing. So um, I think it's, a, it's a, like a, it has to be a collective kind of F, uh, collection of, of methods where what does my student need and how do I fit the method to the student, not the vice versa. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Salim, sir, in your classes, what type of teaching methodology or practices do you think your students would benefit most from? Uh, this is a good question actually because I have uh, recently uh, tried to apply a method and, uh, uh, and Mr. Eli uh, lecture I attended uh, uh, yes the uh, MLD and uh, I have tried to uh, practice one of the lectures that I attend and try it on my classroom and it was actually effective so uh, I took a picture uh, show it to the students and just ask them and uh, as uh, our colleagues here mentioned that to fit the method to the students not the otherwise so uh, what I was trying to do here is just let the student start to uh, generate words then uh, as you say uh, uh, what do we call it uh, uh, yes uh, eh, words then 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 uh, phrases, but it has uh, detail. Yeah, I remember. It was word details, then a uh, sentence. Yeah. So this, uh, the students started, uh, you know, uh, making words. Then they jumped to the next one. Phrases. Then uh, that called the detail. Okay. Then started with sentences. I find out that the students can, uh, or uh, eighty percent of the students, start to be active in the class more uh, on the the. I mean, the method was more effective than the previous one that uh, we were using uh, the last years because the students here uh, giving me words from his knowledge and that's just memorizing something that I give him. I don't tell him to memorize these words and then, uh, okay, what does it mean? Uh, what does this mean and what does that mean? But when I give him a picture, the students can pick what uh, thing or what he can see in the picture and I understand and he can form it to his own uh, method. 
So, and that was uh, very effective. The students started, yeah, and by the way, by the end of the lesson, I play the audio and the students find out that they already done the uh, lesson before the, uh, yeah, before even the lesson starts. Excellent, thank you for that contribution there. And uh, tomorrow morning, Mr. Eli will present on what Mr. Salim has just talked about and how it is working effectively in his classroom. Now, uh, Mr. Yusuf, sir, you know, uh, what type of teaching methodology do you think students would benefit most from? Okay. Now, uh, in actual classrooms, you know, when you go to classrooms, life is not only black. It, there are shades of colors extending from black to white. And uh, most of the classes that uh, I attended there were grammar translation, audiolingual approach. Now it's being changed. There is a change. Um, um, communicative approach is there, but when you talk to teachers, they say we are applying communicative approach without knowing what does it take to apply communicative approach. Now for students, for students to get or to get the most benefit possible, uh, they need to be the center of the learning itself. Um, now, also, uh, so to be the center of learning, we need to do um, probably to apply methodologies like communicative approach, probably task-based uh, learning, uh, probably uh, what they call the deep end strategy or technique, uh, where you throw them in, 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 in a learning situation and let them, you know, uh, get the... the, the uh, the uh, intended um, idea behind the lesson itself. Uh, yet, um, uh, let me say this: um, in our for our learning to be fruitful, we need to know that we are teaching for two things. Either we are teaching for academic purposes, which is for for university level, or for life skills. The thing is, in our schools right now, we are focusing on academic purposes and neglecting the life skills. And this is why our teaching, in my point of view, this is why our teaching is, is, is you know, the, the product is not up to the expectation itself. Now, had we started with uh, a focus on the life skills that a student need until he is able to reach a certain level we, where he can use the language uh, in, 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 in daily life, then we move on to uh, focusing on the needed skills to be successful academically. Then we can get them to university level with the at least the minimum required skills for them to go on and to continue to pursue their education. But right now, um, we are we are lost between the two. We're not, we are neglecting one and focusing on the other without without giving them the right attention. And let me say one thing here to conclude with: uh, uh, education is, or learning itself, e it's either incidental or intentional. Uh, uh, and you know, and most of you knows that incidental learning is more beneficial than intentional because we as human have limits we have limits to how many words we can memorize that's the intentional uh, the, the intended like uh, education but incidentally i can learn as many words as possible because once i'm stuck in 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 a situation and i needed a certain word that word will be fixed there it will not fade away but once i teach you Okay, these are ten words. Memorize them and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow we come like with eight of them. At the end of the week, only one or two will be there. So we need to work on our incidental techniques, like uh, on techniques that cater for uh, incidental learning rather than intentional learning. Excellent. Thank you. As we've heard from the panelists there, where they said uh, previously that there was a, a lot of translation, grammar translation and audio lingual, an audio lingual used and there's been a, a, more of a shift over the last four years 
to become more student-centered. Now, have a think about in your class and your practices, have you made that shift yourselves as well as reported by our panelists? Now, Dr. Abdullah, sir, you know, what, what more needs to be addressed or done for a change in teaching practices to be effective? What more can we do, both as teachers, supervisors, as higher educational institutions, to further push these changes in practices, Doctor? Thanks, that's a good question. <clears throat> uh, I think t too many things can be done. We need the uh, the teachers to do a lot to motivate the learners to become lifelong learners because they have access nowadays to a tremendous amount of information. They can access the internet and they can Google anything and they uh, can uh, expand their knowledge of so many things. This is one. Uh, second, we should encourage uh, students also to use language in creative ways. Uh, when I ask a question, sometimes I teach future teachers nowadays, and I, and I always ask them, okay, if I ask you a real question, I expect a real answer. When we say, for example, where did you go yesterday, probably he will give you a false answer. I went to the, 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 the I went to the supermarket, I went to, so I'd like uh, learning and teaching to be as real as possible. I know that the classroom is, is not a real context, but even though I can encourage students to use language in a rather different way, <clears throat> to mimic real situations. Uh, another way we can uh, encourage students, we can ask them to reflect on their own performance, uh, read a lot, listen to authentic materials, uh, try to communicate, try to talk to natives or non-natives, try to uh, use language in real context, uh, communicating uh, their thoughts and ideas uh, in, in, in real situations. Also, I'd like them to <clears throat> focus on some skills. Reading, for example, is a neglected skill. We don't ask our students to read. And I see that in, in, in my classroom. Um, even in first language, they don't read. The more the students read, the better they can write. The more they listen, the better they can speak. Uh, and, and finally, we should always uh, pay attention to realities. We expect a lot from students but in real situations, we think that students still struggling with learning language. I have students, university, who still misuses uh, uh, third person singular S. I have students who use double subjects in, in a single sentence. The policemen, they capture the thief. And I ask them, why do you use double subjects in a single sentence? I get no answers. Excellent. Thank you, Doctor. As you could hear, uh, Dr. Abdullah said uh, things about um, reading and listening activities that can be done outside of the class. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to hear from two female students and two male students on some of their self-learning activities that they contribute to their learning journey outside of the, outside of the classroom. Now, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fatima, you know, what are some of your, your thoughts on what needs to be addressed to contribute to this uh, change in practice? Well, I think there's a lot of things that we need to address. We're always blaming the teachers. That's the problem. We're always saying, well, the teacher needs to do this and the teacher needs to do that. But the thing is, we need to stand beside the teacher and look what, at what they need, uh, whether it's male or female. Another thing is, I have to involve my students in building the curriculum, um, choosing the methodologies, strategies, and so forth. 
I also have to address the fact that when you go into classrooms, you find 50 to 40 to 45 students in a classroom, and that is not easy. If you're going to assess all those students, and we have continuous assessment in the primary stage, we have also continuous assessment in speaking and listening, it's very difficult for the teacher. So I need to address all of these factors, as well as involving the parents. Sometimes we don't listen to the parents' needs also. They know more about what their, student, what their kids need than what, what we do. And so we need to think of it as like a triangle where I have the parent, the student, and the teacher. And I have to look at all these three factors and look at the number of students, the number of skills that need to be assessed, the curriculum, is it working or not? And um, if it's not working, I have to find out what the reason is. I have to pinpoint the reasons because we're still going into that same cycle. We don't have better learning outcomes. We look at the achievement tests, but we don't look at the performance tasks. And that's our problem. Mr. Yusuf, as a, as a supervisor in, in Mecca, do you, do you incur similar thoughts to, and ideas to Ms. Fatima? And uh, what things do you think needs to be addressed for change in practices? For a change in practice. Now, in my opinion also, the most important thing is to start with changing our um, curriculum at the university level. Because as a student in the English language department, I was, let me say, hammered with, a, with tons and tons of syntax, morphology, uh, phonology, semantics, a lot of, you know, abstract subjects. And after spending like four years within those, uh, in between those courses, I was assigned to a school in an area where most of them probably that was uh, in, in the first intermediate level. And it was their, like the first time they faced English at that time. Uh, so none of what I've learned at school was helpful. That's the key element. Now, why do we still teach syntax morphology? It is needed, no doubt about that. But the question is, what I need as a teacher is, a, is tons and tons of ESL and EFL like strategies. So why don't we shift toward like, uh, a, a like establishing course in, in school, in universities, where we uh, uh, like help our teacher to be ESL or EFL teacher. Not, not an English language like, let me say, specialist, though I know the word is not right, but we are specialists. Let me, give me a sentence, I'll draw the tree diagram and I'll draw it fast. That's one thing. The other thing is, you give me a course like, let me say, smart class, and give me only two periods per week. And you expect me to produce a, a student, uh, to end up with a student who is able to, to, to communicate at that level with two weeks, two periods a week. And within like tons of other Arabic taught courses, it cannot be done. This is one thing. The other thing, in the intermediate level, it's harder even, four periods a week. And in the Quran, schools, we have only three or two periods a week. It's, it's absurd. Actually, I think it is absurd. That's one thing. The other thing is, our teacher, I don't blame them, because they are the products of our system, of our educational system. But I remember that when we did the first test, and you remember that, Mr. Brendan, about 200 30 students, 30 teachers scored 45 or less, which is equivalent to four in the aisles, out of about 470, which is about 50%. So if the teacher level is at, at that level, do you expect our student to be successful? Do you expect that we will end up, we'll, we'll end up with uh, um, a level that will be satisfactory to, to us as educators or to our uh, country? No. That's uh, so, and I can't talk forever if you'd like. <laughs>
No problem. I like how you're so honest and just put it right out there for consideration. <laughs> you're a star, Mr. Yusuf. <laughs> now, as you, can, as you can hear, there are things that are being addressed, but there are challenges. There are challenges to be, to, to be, to be, to be met. And a, a challenge can be exciting and it can be fun and it can be something that can be collectively wor worked on. Now, just to remind you, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask the panel, please write them down on a piece of paper and pass them to somebody, and I can ask the, ask the panel for, for you. Now, we've heard from the two supervisors and uh, also Dr. Abdullah. Now, for, from a teacher's point of view, Mr. Kadeja, what, what do you think needs to be addressed to, to further change practices? What do you need as a teacher? to assist you changing practices or perhaps assist your colleagues changing? Well, when we, when we talk about change in the classroom, we have to look, as Ms. Falk was talking about before, but basically everything we talk about, the syllabus, the parents behind the students, the students themselves, their motivation, and then we talk about teachers. We are, we're the givers, we, we're the ones that basically will collect all of that and then administrate it to the person, and then we want to see the results. In the classroom, um, there's a very big focus on the syllabus. Finish the syllabus, finish the syllabus, finish the syllabus. Did, what day did you give it? Did you give it? Did you give it? Did you? My life is not supposed to be for syllabus. I need the girl to know how to say, excuse me, uh, can I take the green one or the blue one? Or, excuse me, have you seen the bathroom? Or, uh, I need to go to the bathroom. This is real life. We're trying to teach them real languages here. We're not t teaching them just a book on what they're supposed to be learning from the book. What grade do you teach? I teach high school, 10th, 11th, and 12th English, of course. Um, but the fact is, they're not using it. They're basically memorizing what's in the book, they get their marks, and then they leave. That's, all that, that's basically what their focus is. Their focus is, I need to get into college, what am, I want my full mark, and that's it. She really doesn't... Well, the majority don't care <laughs> if they actually speak the language very well or not, as long as they get their marks. And of course, in my classroom, I don't enforce that at all. I enforce them to speak the language because it's a language. They cannot ask for anything without speaking. They cannot come into the classroom without speaking English. They cannot ask to do anything if they're not speaking in English, because I will not answer them. So making it real, is it's very important. How can you make the language real to the student? Is what I'm trying to say. How can they make? It, how can you make them feel that this is important for them to use? This is infor, important for them to waste their time, as they say, on it. How can I? How can I learn the language and see that I'm actually um, using it? How is it going to benefit me? This is the change that we need in the classroom. Yeah, how, at me as a student, what do I get out of, of, of learning the language? How is it going to help me and benefit me? This is basically their, their point of view. And I, I've got students in the classroom that they've got pushed from the parents because you need to get into a medical school or, or engineering or something like that. And yes, the, you'll see them excel in the language because they've got that backing from the parents as well. So you've got private teachers, they travel whatsoever. So they see the language as, uh, as a tool, as we stated before. And then you've got the girls that have absolutely no connection to the language at all. They don't speak it at home. They don't have anybody that speaks it at all. They don't know anyone that uses it whatsoever. So to them, there is no connection. That is our challenge. That is our challenge to make those students that have absolutely no link to the language at home realize how important it is to them. And that is by showing them being me the teacher, showing them how I use it, how it benefited me in the past, how it's benefiting me now, opening up their um, um, minds to the fact that the language, you can use it in reading, and that's why we have reading classes. I have a book club, and I've been holding this book club for years in my classroom, 
Um, we have m monthly meetings with the book. This is in the recesses. This has nothing to do with the classroom. I encourage the girls to read. I ask them basically weekly, what are the books that you're reading, be it Arabic or English? Read. And then I try to, uh, uh, try to pull them to read English. And they do, and it's, it improves. Uh, I have them ask them about shows that they watch and movies that they watch. They pick up language, but it has to be real. Excellent, thank you. As you can hear there. From uh, Ms. Khadija, she spoke about some of the, the external influence, parental involvement in the educational process of their children, and perhaps the importance, and also motivational factors for students, whether it be university, career, or some other factor. Now, we've got a question from the audience from Shakra, who's talking about teachers' motivation. Now, Mr. Salim, the question is for consideration, is how can, how can we improve teachers' motivation? Not only how can teachers' motivation be improved, but how can it, it be built upon for you as a teacher? Of course, the students is going to be the the uh, most motivation here, because when you uh, when you find your work that is uh, uh, when you find that what you've been doing all the year is is working, and the students start to be active with you, this is the the uh, the most uh, important motivation that is gonna push you forward and keep you you know keeping keeping on going on. So uh, I still believe the students is the most motivation for me to go, keep going in the class. Fantastic! Something for all the teachers out there to consider. What 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 motivates you? You know, what's what's motivation? Is it self? Is it student? Is it is it country? Does the vision 2030 motivate you? Things along the, those lines. Now. We've talked a, a little bit about student outcomes and perhaps the expectation from when students graduate and the difference between the expectation from that graduate and perhaps the expectation of the universities who accept these. So the question is, would standardized proficiency tests for students by year level, particularly at high school, be a good idea? Why or why not? And we'll look at it from a university perspective first, please, Dr. Abdullah. Okay, there, there must be some sort of a benchmarking. We need to determine the student's level based on uh, comparisons with high stakes tests. Uh, I'll not be talking about the TOEFL or the IELTS because these are high, really high stakes tests. Uh, but if we can create a test against which uh, performance of students can be compared and contrasted, this would be uh, uh, a good idea. Why? Because we need to know the actual level of our students. The job market also is, uh, has tremendous pressure now. They'd like the students to meet some sort of standards, so this is a good idea. But the exams, whether school-based exams or university entrance exams, will not solve the problem. We need actually benchmarking. We need um, uh, exams to be conducted in order to determine the actual level of the students. Yeah, excellent, thank you. But uh, for, from the K to 12 so side of things, and I'll start with you, Mr. Mr. Yusuf. I know that we've talked a little bit about memorization of the language, and whilst uh, not all proficiency tests revolve around um, memorization, should there be one, a standardized test but perhaps mixed in with some task-based assessment for formative and uh, using the language 
in real life situations. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about tests, uh, we need to know our, our, our goal or, or what is the purpose behind those tests. Uh, assessment, in my point of view, now if we'd like to assess our students, then we need to assess them in a, a real life like situation. Uh, now, tests on paper, they do not reflect the actual level of the student. Though they give you an indication, but is not the actual level of the student. To be, uh, if we're gonna teach the language based on the life need of the student, then we need to test him based on that assumption. We need to test them based on what we expect, and I think we need to involve, as you mentioned, some tasks. Uh, uh, also, nowadays we are giving uh, the, the, the bulk of the score on, on the test itself. Now, like uh, 50 or something based on the test itself, which is not right because if I'm, I'm going to test language, then I'd like to know if he's able to speak. Now, even the speaking test that we do nowadays is not accurate at all. And, and there, there are a lot of manipulation going on beyond the, 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 you know, the scene itself. Uh, so why don't we, if it is possible, something like the one in the aisles where a, the, the student is met face to face and with someone who is not from the school itself, probably, yeah. Uh, if we can ask him to do something, a task in the, in the real world to go and, and do something with, with s some certain, uh, let me say, rubric that guarantee that everything is done according to the what we are supposed to do so is it okay yes so, that's uh, fantastic thank you so perhaps some sort of a final uh, proficiency outcome particularly to bridge the gap between the high school and the higher education sector not only the higher education sector but also the growing vocational sector where a lot of those programs are taught in English, but also ma uh, combine it with some form of formative assessment. Now, we've got a comment from the, from the audience, from the ladies' side, that says, technology plays an important role as a medium for teaching any language, as we heard from Dr. Thomas uh, previously. In the 21st century, we have to focus on it. And many of the students know how to use the technology Perhaps technology can be more of a motivator if we used more of it and had more access to it. Yes, sir, Dr. Abdullah, please. I'll, I'll speak about technology. Sometimes te I know that technology is a, a driving force for change, but uh, I, I do have some doubts about too much technology in classroom. Uh, we all know that language is, is learned if people communicate with each other. And technology can be a great facilitator, but not to that. To that. Don't believe that technology is going to solve all, all, all the problems. I know that technology is good, appreciated by the students. Students are enthusiastic about using technology, particularly mobile phones. But I don't think that too much um, emphasis should be put in technology. The teacher, I believe, the teacher is the uh, uh, most important factor in, in the whole learning and teaching process. But I know that uh, teachers are usually overburdened. I, I, I can't think of a teacher teaching 24 period, 24 periods a week. This is, this is too much. They are overburdened. They are underpaid, they are underappreciated, and this cannot, cannot work well if we would like to improve circumstances for better uh, teaching, conducive to better teaching. Thank you, Doctor. We're going to run out of time. I've got one question. Yeah, I want to add something to it. Okay, just uh, quickly. Um, uh, Dr. Abdullah, what we mean by using technology in the public schools or um, primary and intermediate and high school, 
stages is it's used as a tool. And sometimes the teacher doesn't not have enough time to finish what she's trying to accomplish inside the classroom. So they use Google Classroom, they use Edmodo, they use a lot of uh, like student engagement tools where there's some sort of collaboration between the teacher and the students or students between students. So they're learning offline. They're not really inside the classroom. And, and it does help because it does improve. We had one teacher who applied for Jeddah Prize in, in Jeddah and we looked at her file and she was teaching primary education. The students were video themselves speaking and their speaking improved because they were doing that. They also wrote. So she in integrated all four skills inside the Google Classroom or whether she used uh, Edmodo, whatever. But whatever the tool she used, it did improve the language outcomes. So it's used as a tool, but it does not replace the teacher. Also, we have flipped classrooms. All of that stuff does improve the language learning process. It doesn't uh, take away from it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, for one, use Edmodo in my class. It's a flipped classroom. I use it in my classroom. I use it for the reading lessons because there's no time for them to read the whole passage in the classroom. So I have them prepare that at home. And when they do, I have them do research and they'll come back f with a lot of information and the, the class is uh, just in, ignited with information. It is, it's, it's very um, refreshing and it's, in, it's nice to see that the girls actually speak in the classroom. And I do believe that some, some of the technology, not everything, and not to, is, uh, some technology is very good, but not, not the entire class, a part of the class should be um, with technology. We use it a lot with grading as well. We do electronic um, grading and stuff. Of course, this is not uh, done with all schools in some of the classrooms. But yes, I do believe technology has, has a, a little footprint in there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. It was uh, interesting to hear about the thoughts on technology. I know we are pressed for time at the present, and um, I've got these couple of questions here, and I apologize, but I will keep them to tomorrow. I do encourage you all to attend the sessions this afternoon, and please come back tomorrow. I know that the presentations and the, the uh, speakers in the morning are excellent, and will further the information that Mr. Salim spoke, to, spoke about that has benefited his classes in a very short period of time. Tomorrow on the panel, we will also hear from four students along with Dr. Hind and the two teachers from there. So please come. But this morning, I'd like to thank you all for, for your time and uh, your patience and listening and your participation through your listening skills. I'd like to thank our panel, firstly, the Dr. Abdullah from King Saud University. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Yusuf, the head of supervision in Mecca. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Fatima, the head of supervision in Jeddah. Thank you. And our two teachers, Mr. Salim, thank you. And Mrs. Khadija, thank you. I hope some of the thoughts raised this morning have got you to think about what you do and provide you something to reflect on. Okay. I think it's morning tea. And we welcome back Mr. Eli, thank you. Uh, now, actually, we would like to uh, give the uh, quiz for uh, the, uh, the names that men not mentioned, and sorry for being late for them. Uh, 
Mrs. Munira Sderi from the ladies' side. Vafir uh, Al-Gerni. Mr. Abdullah al Hussein, Musa Swedi, Lusedi, sorry, Thomas Lorenz. From Macmillan, Thank you very much for all. Uh, now we enjoy your break, coffee break, please. Thank you. Dr. Noor Shaya, please. Sorry for that. 